two men who came to the temple to pray. Of these two men, if we were to put it into modern, contemporary context, one of them would be a pastor, at the very least, a pastor, or maybe even a, a bishop, and the other would be a political criminal, maybe even a neo Nazi, a bigot, racist, misogynist, and all that. If we were to look at this on the surface, most of us, I think, would be very quick to side with the bishop and not so much with a political criminal or a neo-Nazi. Because the story that's being told in Luke today in, in, in presenting these two characters to us, <clears throat> that's the equivalent of who they are in that culture. A Pharisee, you understand, I mean, has all the respect in the community because he's a man of God. A tax collector was, as far as the Jews were concerned, scum of the earth. The only appropriate parallel that I can draw that would really tell you how tax collectors were seen were things that, uh, around events that happened in Germany, um, in Poland, in World War II, during the rise of the Nazis, where they were employed by the Nazis were Jewish men whose responsibility it was, whose job it was to round up their fellow Jews, process them, and put them on freight trains they were headed toward extermination camps all over Europe. That's what a tax collector effectively would have been. That's how a tax collector would have been seen as in Jesus' time. They were taking money from their own people, robbing their own people to pay the Roman government who in turn would use the resources to enforce their own laws upon the Jews. Now, of course, this didn't just happen with the Jews. It happened with every nation that the Romans conquered. And people from their own nations would be employed by the Romans to collect taxes to be used against them. Now, that in and of itself is bad. What makes it worse is that tax collectors were routinely criticized for being greedy. In other words, when you only had to pay one dollar in taxes, tax collectors would take four or five and give the portion that belongs to the Romans and keep the rest for themselves. So they were seen as unethical, greedy, backstabbing traitors. And of these two people, one who is seen as a pillar of the community, one who is seen as a backstabbing traitor, of these two people, Jesus says, it's the tax collector. It's the neo-Nazi. It's the bigot, the racist, the misogynist who went home justified by God that day. Not the bishop, not the pastor, not the Pharisee. That should disturb you. Because it disturbs the foundation of what we believe to be proper. Whether you're liberal or conservative, whether you're Republican or Democrat, this t 
teaches us a very, very valuable lesson. So here's a, here's a question I'm going to ask you, okay? Liberals and conservatives, Republican Democrats, have one thing in common. Well, lots of things in common. One of the things in common. What do you think that might be? Okay, we want what's best for ourselves. Okay, if you wanted to kind of expand that, let's just say this, okay? What we have in common with each other is that we all want what's best for our nation. Can we accept that? Yeah? Whether you're liberal, conservative, Democrat, or Republican, we all want what's best for our nation. And we all want, by extension, what's best for the global community, yes? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? To want what's best for all. There's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong with that is when we want what's best for others, best for ourselves at the expense of others. When we want what's best at the expense, and the word that Luke uses, not at the expense, but at the scorn of others, That's where the problem is. Yes, we all want what's best. But the problem is we can't agree to disagree. And it's so urgent that we implement our own version of what we believe is best at the exclusion of others' views. That make sense? Whether you're liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, what we have in common is that we're all confident in our own righteousness. We're, we're all confident in our own thinking. And there's nothing wrong with that, as I said, but we run into conflict when we have to tout and promote our beliefs at the expense of others. In every level of relationship, everybody wants something that's different from others. That's normal. But when we try to make what we want, the only thing that matters exclusively, that's what creates conflict. So yes, we want what's best for all. But what's wrong with this picture is we want what's best for all according to what I want at the scorn of you. And this is what Jesus is trying to show here. Pharisee comes, and what does he say? I thank you, God, that I am not like others. Can you imagine? Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? <laughs> thank you, God, that I am not like Dave. <laughs> well, we've all prayed that. I mean, that's just, we've all prayed that prayer. Even, I. Even Dave, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a horrible prayer that is. Thank you, God, that I am not like others. Certainly not like that guy over there. And that guy could be anybody. It could be a prayer that goes something like this. Oh, thank God I'm not a woman. Thank God I'm not African American. Thank God I'm not a Mexican. Thank God I'm not poor. And the, the biggest one is thank God I'm not Asian. <laughs> Shame on you. Huh? What is that? You pray that every day. I figured you would. <laughs> what kind of a horrible prayer is that? And here he is, a religious leader in the community, in mired 
and steeped in his own self-righteousness. Aren't we like that? All, all joking aside, haven't you once thought, thank God, if you're being honest, of course you have. Before I became a pastor, I was, a, uh, an, I was an administrator at a major university in Dallas, Texas, Southern Methodist University. And my job in the university was to train leaders for the future, college students. And during leadership training, one of the things that we talked about always was this, disagreement is okay. Dissension is not. In other words, don't let your ideas get in the way of dialogue. Don't let what you believe prohibit you from listening to what other people have to say. Because what makes a true leader is not being able to push my own agenda, but being able to listen to all agendas and out of them choosing what's best for all. That makes sense? Makes sense, right? If we're being honest, what we taught is no one is ever 100% right. And no one is ever 100% wrong. To truly be a leader, you have to understand that. But where we are today is that we all think liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats all believe they're 100% right and the other is 100% wrong. You know what else we have in common other than our own self-righteousness? It's fear. We're all afraid. Everyone in this country right now is afraid. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of losing what they believe is important. the root cause of our inability to listen to each other and have dialogue with people. What I say before, people see what they want to see. People hear what they want to hear. People believe what they want to believe regardless of the evidence that you present before them. I don't know if you do this or not, but I watch MSNBC, CNN, Fox, And I I watch these news programs where they constantly talk about the same thing over and over and over again. And the mental gymnastics that people have to do to try to convince the other person on the panel that they're right is incredible. The amount of mental gymnastics and jumping through hoops and reasoning and justifications that's being employed, it is incredible. And they're all afraid of losing what they believe to be right, that they talk over each other. They talk, they don't talk to each other. You understand the difference? Yeah, they don't talk to each other. There's no dialogue. It's, it's a screaming match. And oftentimes I just have to turn it off because three or four people are going at the same time and I have no idea what the heck they're saying. We're all afraid. This not only happens on the political level, it happens everywhere, even in church. In my previous church, as a new pastor going into the church, um, there was a guy who came to me, and, and no kidding, he comes to me and says, I want you to remember something. I say, oh yeah, what's that? This is my church, and don't you forget it. Well, I'll get to that. It's not 
so wrong or bad for a person to have ideas, yes? In fact, having ideas is a good thing. If you don't have any ideas, I would worry about you. Having an idea is not in and of itself bad. In fact, it's a good thing. But promoting your idea at the expense of others, that's what we call self-righteousness in today's term, in today's context. And then we use justification to make what we do okay. We use justification to validate or to confirm our behavior. And this is what that looks like. Have you all, has any, have any of you ever been on a diet? Raise your hand, okay? Have you, has any of you ever gone to the gym? Raise your hand if you have. All right, so what happens when people go on a diet and they go to the gym to try to better their health and all that kind of stuff? You work hard, right? You sacrifice a lot, right? That's good. But what's not good is they give themselves what? After all of the hard work, what do we do? Huh? We reward ourselves by doing what? The very thing that got us into the gym in the first place. The very thing that put us on a diet in the first place. Right? We say, oh, I've been good Monday through Thursday, so Friday, I'm going to pig out. People who go to the gym call it a cheat day. Oh, yeah, I've been good Monday through Thursday, so Friday is my cheat day. And then Friday turns into Saturday, and then Saturday turns into next year. It's like this. We do some good things, and then all of a sudden, we feel entitled to do some bad things. Let me put it to you a different way. This will make more sense to you. I've had so many people come up to me over the years and say things like this. I'm not a murderer. I've never killed anybody. I've never cheated. I've never stolen anything. As if not doing those things gives them permission to be racist. Bigots, misogynists, how is that mutually inclusive? Yeah, sure, you didn't kill anyone, but that doesn't give you the right to hate people, does it? Does it? Yeah, you didn't steal anything, but that doesn't give you the right to be a bigot. The problem is people don't do bad things, but that doesn't automatically make them good people. You understand that? Just because I don't go killing people doesn't make me an automatically a good person. But that's the reasoning that people use. Yeah, I've been good by not killing people. So now all of a sudden I see myself as being good. That's self-righteousness, being righteous. Or righteousness is a bestowment from God. In other words, God deems us righteous, not we ourselves. But let's go back to what Jesus said. If you think about someone in a not-so-loving way, if you hate someone in your heart, what did Jesus say? You've already committed murder. So, back to this guy at my previous church. It turns out he had the moxie to come and say what he said to me because he was one of the major donors of the church. He was a major something, that's right, yeah, but... But because he gave a lot to the church, Somehow he felt that entitled him, gave him the entitlement to dictate what the church ought to look like. 
But that's what I'm saying. That's self-righteousness. Looking at our world today, my friends, we don't need self-righteous leaders. We don't need smart leaders. We don't need powerful leaders, strong leaders, beautiful leaders, intelligent leaders. You know what we need? We need leaders who love. We need leaders who show compassion. We need leaders who are meek. Yes, I have the power to crush you. Yes, I have the strength to put you away and the authority to do it. But let's sit down and hammer this thing out before it gets any worse. That's meekness. Do we see that today? In some situations, yeah, we do see it. We don't need strong leaders. We don't need smart leaders. We don't need beautiful leaders, intelligent leaders. We need leaders who are meek and humble. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. To turn our nation around, we need meek leaders, servant leaders who will model for us compassion and mercy and love. We need leaders like Gandhi. We need leaders like Mother Teresa. We need leaders like Bonhoeffer. We need leaders like Martin Luther King. We need leaders like Jesus. Someone with the heart and the character of Christ. Who said, if someone strikes you on one cheek, what should you do as my disciples? Turn the other cheek. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt as well. If someone forces you to walk a mile, walk two miles. And we don't do this because we're weak. We do it because we're meek. We do it because we're humble. We do it because we have the heart and the mind of Christ. By this they shall know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. That's what Jesus said. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. 